like uh, first thing to tell them thank you so much for volunteering your time and to be here with us we all really appreciate it and then uh, if uh, we can go around and you can introduce yourself to the students Ideiko, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. Um, how do I turn on the microphone? Is it on? OK, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hidehiko Inagaki. I'm a research group leader here. Um, so let me talk about a little bit about my background. So I was born in Tokyo, Japan. And I, did, I was there until my college. I went to University of Tokyo. And for my PhD, for my PhD, I moved to the US. So I went to Caltech for my PhD and went to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Ashburn, Virginia, for my postdoc. And from 2019, just before the pandemic, I started my lab here and has been here for four years right now. So yeah, um, when I was in high school, um, I, my high school was just in front of the University of Tokyo. So I had a lot of opportunity to visit there and did some summer work there. And that was very helpful because, you know, Along that time, I was not sure what I'm going to do in the future. And just knowing how people do science and knowing that I may like it was very helpful, right? Because, of course, you know, you want to do something you really like. And until you try, it's kind of hard to tell, right? So uh, it was very helpful. And also in the college, I went to multiple labs so that I can really um, figure out what I really like. So I think it's really great that you're here. So that you know you can see you know how people do science and you know just keep doing this kind of thing and that will help you to get idea whether you like it and if you like it then you should just do it right so um, and I still talk with my high school teacher it has been many many years ago right uh, since I graduated there but the high school biology teacher was very great and encouraged me to be a scientist so it's great that you have an amazing <laughs> teacher who brought you here so okay and with that um, yeah I'm very excited to talk with you today. Thank you so much. Cosco, I think it's already on. It's on? OK, perfect. Hey, everybody. Well, thanks for coming today. Um, so my name is Goksu Oz. Uh, I'm a fifth year PhD student in Dr. Rohe Yusuda's lab. Um, so I design innovative tools uh, to uh, manipulate the molecular activity to be able to study their roles in learning and memory processes. Uh, so. I am actually originally Turkish. I, did, I, I went to high school in Turkey and uh, started my undergraduate for information systems engineering in Turkey in Istanbul Technical University. Uh, after one year of um, education, uh, I like, departed from Turkey and came to the United States uh, to Florida Atlantic University and started to study psychology and neuroscience in FAU. Uh, I graduated from FAU, and in my uh, senior year, and actually sophomore year, starting from sophomore year or so, uh, I was volunteering in a lot of the FAU neuroscience labs. Uh, and the dean of graduate college, uh, Dr. Robert Stackman in FAU today, uh, was one of my mentors. He encouraged me to, to pursue a career um, in neuroscience, uh, get a PhD degree perhaps, uh, so I applied for the PhD programs at FAU. Uh, one of them was the IMPRESS program that the Max Planck Florida Institute offers. Uh, so I got accepted to this program uh, and started my PhD in Rohe Yusuda's lab. And now it has been fifth. It, it has been five years, and the, the, the time flew by. And I cannot even um, believe how much I have accomplished uh, since I came to this institute. So if you have any questions about switching majors or um, I mean switch, like going to a different country uh, and just like starting from scratch, you know, I started with a psychology degree and then started to build up a neuroscience uh, background and now uh, I'm doing, uh, I'm building my career around neuroscience. So if you have any questions about these, please uh, don't hesitate to ask me. But thank you very much for your interest, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> Nino? Hello, everyone. So my name is Nino Mancini. I'm French, despite the name. Um, so I started two years ago here in the lab of Salil Bidaye, and um, we work on the fruit flyers of Hila. So I don't know whether 
they had the occasion to see the fly today. They didn't see the fly today. You didn't so see the fly. You can say how amazing but they are. You may have <laughs> seen the fly in your kitchen. You know, these really tiny flies uh, near <laughs> your fruits, if you have rotten fruits. Um, so we work with those because it turns out they can walk pretty well and they have also a brain. So we want to understand how their brain allows them to walk like we also walk. So we hope in the pretty longer run we can also understand how do we walk, um, how the animals walk and you know, inspire research for you know, um, biomedical uh, relevance, for example, or even application in robotics. Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited to talk with you today. Great, so the panel is open for questions. So you can start to line up at the microphones if you have any questions. And while you think about your questions, we can start with one that is a classical question, that is, uh, what do, we en do you enjoy most of your daily work? Hideiko? Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, as I kind of mentioned during my introduction, I, I think um, what's great about science, from my perspective, is I'm having, like, I'm working on something I really like. So you know, although it's a work, you know, on a daily basis, I'm doing something I really like the most, and of course, always it's a, there is a tough time. You know, not always experiments work, and not always we can get grants, and there are a lot of things happens. But still, um, that's the kind of thing I like. You know, I, I keep doing it, um, something I'm curious about, and you know, once in a while we get really something interesting finding, then that's uh, really exciting. So, um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much what I enjoy, and also um, it has been really um, great to work with my lab members. So there are <coughs> many people in the lab now. Uh, there are like ten people, roughly, in my lab, and they're all amazing people. And it has been really great pleasure for me to work with my team. Yeah, yeah. I will say um, we really are a privileged group of people. Um, we're witness discoveries being made in real time here at MPFI. And I think I, I, I really admire this and I, I love this aspect of our job. Um, but in addition to that, I would say uh, we get to travel a lot and we um, get to meet with a lot of accomplished scientists, uh, very amazing brains. So I think uh, these two are my two favorite aspects of being a neuroscientist and working here. You were in Japan recently, right? Yes, I, I, I went to Japan uh, to a seminar uh, called Multidimensional Analysis of Brain, um, Multidimensional Analysis of Brain Hurt, something. <laughs> so um, I gave a talk there. Um, I Sorry, I, I did a poster presentation there. Uh, and I, I was actually awarded for the best poster award in, in Japan. <laughs> thank, <you>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so that was, that was amazing. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So we have other travel plans, like I will probably go to Austria this uh, upcoming year. We get to see a lot of the cities in, within the United States. We go to a lot of seminars, uh, network with really wonderful people, sometimes even Nobel laureates. So it's, it's, it's really amazing <laughs> to be a neuroscientist. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be biased, but. <laughs> Nina? Yeah, so I agree with them. Um, what I like is it's really not a boring job. You know, we have a lot of things uh, to do. Um, but if I would be more specific, I would say um, what I really like is the moment you you do the discovery, like the really moment where you you know you're doing your experiment and and you see before like you know analyzing data everything, you realize you're making something, you're discovering something new, and uh, this like precise moment, maybe you know try the experiment a lot of time and it failed many times, and then. You discover something you expect it or not, um, and then you call your colleagues to to to, to check if it's true, right? Um, I think that's the thing I I really like. Yeah. Okay. Questions. Uh, okay. This is this happen every year, so I'm going to tell you the time is going to run out, and we are going to have ten people that have more questions, but no one wants to be the first. So I'm going to say the first one that asks a question is going to get something from our gift shop, either a T-shirt or <laughs> one. <laughs> I knew it. Or actually, Pretty we good. just got amazing <laughs> socks with neurons. Did you see them? Oh, nice. Socks <laughs> with the uh, original images. So wow. after that, uh, you get the gift from the gift shop. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, uh, please, if you can say your name and your school when you <laughs> ask the question, and also if it's for all of three of them or specifically for uh, one. Okay. Um, so my name is Madison Lambert. I'm from the Benjamin School, and this is for Dr. Heidi Kuka. Um, you were. T I noticed that in like a little blurb about you, you were studying time perception. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I didn't talk about my work at all. Sorry, <laughs> I should have mentioned it. Um, so we are really uh, curious about like how the brain controls the movement and those other cognitive functions. So in our brains, there are like 10 billions of neurons or even more, right? So there are so many neurons in the brain. And actually, they are talking each other all the time. There is a spiking activity which signals from one neuron to the other with some chemicals, and somehow they coordinate um, the computation so that they can, you know, do a lot of amazing stuff, including the precise control of the timing. And we have been focusing on timing behavior uh, using mice, and for multiple reasons. Actually, animals are really good in learning timing because if you think about movement, right? Like even to write something or say something, we you need to control the exact timing of individual movement, right? And how this happens and how they coordinate this is completely unknown. And also, so we are looking at how basically animals make uh, accurate timing of the movement. And in addition, we have been recently looking at how animals learn the timing as well. Because, you know, again, even for linguists, right, first we need to know, like, how to uh, make a sound at the proper timing. And once we learn, we can execute such action, right? And how this happens, again, totally unknown. So we are putting a lot of something we call electrodes into the brain so that we can uh, monitor the activity of many neurons. Uh, while animals are tracking the passage of time and learning, and that has, that's kind of thing you're doing. Okay, thank you. And then I guess I have one more question for all of the panelists. What was the deciding factor of going into neuroscience? Like, what made you like decide I want to yeah. do this for the rest yeah. of my life? So, since I was talking, I'd be the first. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as I told you, during high school, um, I started. Um, going to some labs, and at the beginning, I was more interested in something called molecular biology, like studying the molecules in cells, um, and mainly to treat cancers and this kind of stuff. And also, so I, I continue going this kind of lab even during my undergrad. So I was thinking of more going to the molecular biology field. Um, but during the process, um, I my hobby was programming. So <laughs> I, I designed some uh, code program in order to design some uh, specific sequences to manipulate genes. And that was an interesting project because, you know, uh, there are a lot of machine learning components there. And that made me wonder how the brain works. Um, and so there was a lab just next door to where I was studying the fly brain, like what Mina studies. And I just went there and learned that actually we have no understanding how the brain works, even for simple fly. When I went there, I, I was almost sure like we understand everything because it's such a small animal, but I'm sure that was not the case. So that literally uh, like changed my view and like, okay, we need to really, I want to understand this. And that's how I get interested in neuroscience and I have been changing the, you know, the model from fly to mouse and others uh, during my career. But uh, yeah, that was the starting point. <coughs> So as I mentioned, uh, I started my undergraduate in FAU as a psychology major. Uh, while I was studying, uh, I'm learning about the human behavior, animal behavior, and also on and so on. Um, and I was always asking the same question, but why? Like, why? Why do we behave the way that we behave? What happens uh, chemically or physiologically in the brain that, that makes each individual one of us different from each other or similar to each other. What is going on in the brain? So I started to continue, I, I always, I continue to ask this question uh, pretty much every course that I took in the field of psychology. Why, what is going on in the brain? Why do we do these things? And when we change our behavior, what changes? Like, what do we fix? Or when I was taking the psychopharmacology class, uh, I was learning about all these like chemicals that are, uh, really changing the human behavior or how they feel and how they act. Uh, so I was really interested in the mechanism underlying this 
changes in the behavior. So that got me interested in looking into the brain. And um, I started to volunteer in neuroscience labs and uh, learn more about the neuroscience and the molecular basis of uh, behavior, emotions, uh, learning, memory, and so on. So today I'm, I'm, I'm actually focused on, focusing on learning and memory, but I still have an interest in like how uh, brain, what happens in the brain that induces changes in behavior and how we can help with this in the future because there are a lot of behavioral disorders um, not only behavior, but also learning and memory disorders uh, that neuroscience is um, interested in resolving, right? So uh, in the future, I would like to look at these after having some understanding of this, uh, these changes in the brain, I would like to, to start working on how we can fix these problems uh, with the information that we gather in neuroscience. So that's my drive. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. Yeah, so um, actually, when I was in high school, I wanted to study behavior in monkey. So um, I wanted to go in the forest and you know, study the behavior in the natural habitat. And so I went to university for that. And uh, then it's actually a lecture from one of my former professor, Martin Jurfa, um, that, so he gave this lecture and then I completely changed my mind because um, I realized that we can only uh, study behavior, but we can also, yeah, access the brain and, and uh, understand how the, the brain works and how it controls behavior. And this was in honeybees. So this is the first organism I work with, um, visual learning in bees. And, uh, and then um, for my PhD, I went to Germany to use even more simple animal, the larva of the Drosophila, you know, it's larva. Uh, at the beginning, I was like, okay, can, can people work on that? But actually, yes, we can access their brain. We can study how they learn, how they memorize. And then I, I continue basically yeah, going with uh, this time the fruit fly, so the adult Drosophila here to understand how, how the brain control locomotion. So it's basically, yeah, this interest in uh, opening the black box, um, you know, that, uh, yeah, that controls our behavior. Thank you so much for your questions. Just a little more. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, is this what, is still one t-shirt or the socks though? I know. <laughs> Otherwise we <laughs> This is for Dr. Nino. I was wondering if you could elaborate on like what exactly you studied with fruit flies? Yeah, so similar to what um, Dr. Inagaki said, we, we, under, we want to understand how does the brain allows the fly to perform different maneuvers. Like us, you know, we go, we walk forward, we turn, uh, we do eventually backward walking, and, and the flies can actually do backward walking as well. And so there is actually a big change in the field now is um, a big millstone is that the brain of the fly has been completely reconstructed in three dimensions. So we know basically all the neurons in the fly brain. We don't have so many neurons in the fly brain compared to our brain. We have approximately 100,000 neurons and they're all annotated. So we can look one by one and, 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 and you know, dissect the circuitry. And, and based on this connectome, this big map, uh, we, can, we can ask what's the function of this or this neuron and test this in behavior. Um, so we use a lot of different techniques, you know, genetics, um, microscopy, um, behavior, um, all these different techniques to understand, yeah, the basic principle of locomotion. And then as I was telling in the introduction, we hope this inspires the research for other animals, like, you know, people working in mice or even humans. So we work like all together to kind of, you know, go in the same direction. Can right. you go, uh, Rene, to the microphone? No, so turn the recording. So not me personally, but yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like we. it's a huge consortium of researchers that uh, in collaboration with Google, you know, Janelia has mapped, so I reconstructed uh, the full brain of the fly. Yeah. yeah. Can you go to the microphone because we are recording and so with the microphone and also the recording is going to hear the question. So if you want, yes. Okay. I'm Lila from the Benjamin School. What's like a typical like day in the life um, for you guys, all three of you? <laughs> oh, typical day. So yeah, I'm a research group leader. So uh, this year I stopped doing experiments by myself. Before you know, I was doing more by myself, but 
now you know my team is like 10 people so basically my job is to manage the students and postdoc everyone working in the lab and make sure people are making a good progress so I, I try to talk with basically everyone in the lab um, whenever I come to the lab I just talk with people see their progress um, and discuss ideas and otherwise um, my job is to get money for the lab so that we can do <laughs> research. So a lot of grant writing, paper writing, so writing and managing is the job at, the, at my stage. Yeah, and you can see like what students and postdocs did. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, majority of uh, my work is doing experiments, of course. I say like 90% of it is uh, the experiments, whether that's on the bench, doing some molecular cloning, uh, or biochemical experiment, uh, or it's in the microscopy room, imaging the brain and seeing what molecules are doing in real time when the, when we induce the, when when we stimulate learning in the brain, or um, doing the behavior myself, um, like the, like looking at how uh, the molecules that we manipulated. Uh, in these changes in the behavior. Uh, my majority of my job is to do experiments, uh, analyze these experiments, um, gather the, the results together, and make a story out of it, right? And uh, try to publish uh, these. Uh, some part of my work uh, requires me to teach undergraduates and um, um, post-bac students, um, so I, um, I look at their projects, I try to guide them in the right direction for their projects. Um, I write uh, my papers, pa uh, grants similar to Hidehiko, um, and my thesis, of course. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, and we, we try to, to prepare uh, presentations, posters, and so on, and uh, go to like seminars and stuff. So this is like an entire scoop of uh, what we do in a PhD program. You know, how is your typical day? Yeah, very similar to what Goksu just said, um, except that I don't have to write a thesis anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm relieved for that. But still, uh, we still need to write papers. So we have period of the year. So most of the time we do experiments. I come to the lab. Um, we prepare for the experiments, we write some emails. Um, and then we have period of the year where we more focus on the ri writing of the paper, you know, like analyzing the data, writing the paper. Um, sometimes we prepare for conferences, we have to prepare for talks um, or preparing a poster, stuff like that. Um, during the week, we also meet with our colleagues where we discuss um, papers, you know, from, from other fields or the same field. And we also discuss our results to, to, you know, like um, see which direction we want to go, uh, if the project is going well, what we can improve, what we can change, stuff like that. Yeah, but it's, yeah, very similar to books. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> so Go ahead. This is for Ms. Us. I was wondering, so as someone who like switched their major, would you have any advice for like us as high schoolers like approaching that? Well, don't don't be afraid. <laughs> Just it's it's very likely that you're not going to have a clear answer of who you want to become in the future and there's nothing wrong with switching majors uh, try like try something that you're interested in and if it's not for you you can change your direction uh, like I did and it, finally when you find the thing that is for you then you, you like the success comes with it anyways uh, so I, I I say don't don't be afraid of uh, trying new things yeah. doesn't hurt Thank you. <laughs> Great advice. What's uh, your question? I'm Ryan Fitzpatrick from the Benjamin School. How does it feel to make a discovery? Like, what really goes through your mind on that? <laughs> I guess to all of us, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks it's a hard one. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your question. Actually, you know, it's kind of interesting. When we make the discovery, usually we don't notice it. Because, <laughs> you know, always we, sorry, especially maybe at my stage, I was thinking, maybe it's an artifact, there was a mistake. Who knows, right? <laughs> Maybe this is some noises, right? So, because the, mo you know, basically to the early state, this is a discovery. We need to have a lot of data, right? And then we can finally conclude. But the first moment we encounter thing is like, hmm, 
you should be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, it's it, uh, it's exciting. So I, I'm doing both, right? I, I encourage. Yes, that sounds amazing. Let's do it more. Okay, but at the same time, let's be careful. <laughs> so and finally, it, we get all the data. Then yes. Great. So <laughs> it's not like you know single moment usually. It's like gradual process, and like you know the concern becomes smaller and smaller, and the excitement goes grows larger and larger. That's how it goes in my case, but maybe different. For right. It's totally different for a PhD student. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you get a good data, the excitement is just over the roof. It's, it's <laughs> like, yeah, because 95% 90, of the things that I tried to do didn't work, but finally something is, is there. So like, I see a spark. So it's, 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 very, it's a very exciting moment until you go see your PI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and your PI guy goes and grills to you it's like oh maybe you should consider <laughs> this maybe you should consider that and like you realize that you spend another year uh, for the same discovery that you made and added like more data on top of it and um but answer the questions or the concerns of your pi and your science like the, uh, your peers uh, or, i mean your colleagues <laughs> Yeah, so I'm postdoc, so I'm kind of in between, you know, PI and PhD. <laughs> so I, I was mentioning the, the moment where we get, you know, we, we do the discovery, we're just super excited. Um, but I was also mentioning, I bring my colleagues to check whether what I'm seeing is true or not. And then, um, yeah, uh, what, what Hideko said is we need to actually, you know, confirm. So repeat the experiment many times to see that, okay, what I've seen now is real or almost real. And then I think, yeah, what you feel after a while when you repeat the experiment and other people can also replicate your work. This is when you really feel, you know, confident mm -hmm. and you realize, okay, this might be a real discovery what I've done. Great. <laughs> and actually we have a story, I don't know if you all know, of someone, I'm not going to say the name, that was so excited about what they saw that they smash their head uh, with the glasses and everything against the microscope and they crack the glasses. <laughs> so like there are, like you have sometimes those moments like, yeah. <laughs> What's your question? Uh, hi, I'm Connor at the, from the Benjamin School. Uh, I was wondering what's the most interesting like part of a brain for you guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So my opinion is, um, there, you know, if you see textbook, read textbook, right? Often it says, okay, hippocampus is for memory, uh, you know, visual cortex is for vision, right? And like give you some views that different brain regions have different functions and they're kind of discrete entity. But what we start noticing as an entire field is all of these brain regions are actually talking to each other. So, uh, People who ask that question, and my answer is, no, entire brain is interesting. Do you we should understand the entire brain, in other words, because uh, you know, just looking at one is not enough, because one brain region is getting input from the other, and you know, so. Yeah, may, may add something, like, you know, when I was working learning a memory, we focus on one special structure of the, of the insect brain, uh, called the mushroom body, anyway. But we, we refocus on that, but then, um, I moved to locomotion and then, you know, I focus on other parts of the brain, but more like the full brain. And we realize how much, as Hideiko said, those, those parts are interacting with each other. So you cannot like separate one from the other, you know, but people of course are more focusing on one part of the brain maybe than others. We have experts, but this expertise needs to be shared between researchers to understand how the brain works. It was a good one in five years. I never heard that. Do you have another one? Uh. Go ahead. Uh, what's like the most interesting like animal to work with for you guys? Like any any animal in particular that we you would hope to work with in the future? Yeah, uh, maybe I can answer that because uh, I work on fly before and I switched to mice. And you know, all animals have uh, different behaviors and also different strengths. Like in case of fly, there are a lot of tons of uh, genetic tools we can use. I mean, that's like the first model organism people use uh, like more than like 100 years ago. And so there are a lot of genetic tools, but well, I don't want to say this in front of Nina, but <laughs> <laughs> behavior is somewhat limited compared to mice. I mean, obviously vertebrate can do something more similar to us, right, compared to flies. So depending on your interest and focus, you should select 
the proper model organism. That's the way we should do it. So first think about the question you're interested in and just find the proper animals. And often people go to like very uh, non-typical model organism for their specific goals. Like in this building, there are people who study uh, animals called tree shrews because uh, they're interested in the vision, for example. So yeah, I think, yeah, whatever you're interested in, you should find out the most, the best animal. Yeah, I think it also depends on uh, what approach you want to take, right? And so there are two different approaches that you can take. It's one is called top down. Uh, so you start looking for more complex uh, things to more simple things to be able to dissect like, what's going on in the brain. The other one is the bottom up approach, right? And so you start looking into small things within small neurons in very small structures, and then you uh, go to the top and try to understand the whole network, like what's going on in the brain. So this is also uh, true for the animal models uh, that you're looking at, right? Um, so majority of the learning and memory was actually done in uh, aplasia, which is uh, known as C-slug. It's a very simple model, it's a very simple circuit, but majority of our understanding for learning and memory was actually collected from these animals. And then uh, we now uh, work on learning and memory in uh, mouse model, in mice and rats, and some people do it in monkeys, and even some studies are done in humans now. So. Um, so it really depends on what you try to answer. If you're looking at molecular, uh, if you're looking at molecular activation, if you're looking at like uh, how neurons fire, how they connect each other, and what you, what you, what is your take home message when at the end of your experiments or at the end of your uh, scientific question? So that that will define what kind of animal you will want to work in. It's not like one is more interesting than another. Great. What's Hi. your question? Okay, um, I'm Mary Mallory Cabby, and I'm from Jupiter High School. And I wanted to ask you guys, like, what clubs or classes do you guys recommend we be a part of as high schoolers who are interested in neuroscience? Um, yeah, so I was in a uh, science club when I was in high school, and actually, as part of their activity, I, I went to like labs in university. So that was a uh, very fun and that really determines what I'm doing now but I would say you should do whatever you like <laughs> I mean we, we really cannot predict right uh, what's going to happen because what you're doing now but I, I think uh, I want everyone to enjoy what you like and you know at your stage maybe it's hard to know what you really like so in that sense it's good to try many different things because mm -hmm. unless you try it's really hard to tell so Try many different things could be a good approach, perhaps. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any other advice for what clubs or things to try in high school? Oh, it depends on the students' interests too, <laughs> right? So um, I think it will be good to talk to your teachers about this, uh, and based on your skill set or based on your interest, maybe your sc uh, school teachers could advise you on uh, which clubs would be more helpful for you. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, the same thing applies here too. Don't be afraid to try new things, different things. I think it's going to uh, it's going to widen your um, understanding of everything. So just go ahead and try it. <laughs> Of course, yeah. So, like, uh, like neuroscience, for example, is such an interdisciplinary uh, scientific field. So, we do we like I uh, the, the skills that I learned in information systems engineering. I have, I use it today uh, when I'm trying to do the data analysis and so on. So, uh, although you might think that it's completely disconnected, we actually use all these skills uh, when we uh, are doing our science. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that would be that would be very helpful to do some machine learning or like like some some coding courses. But you don't have to. Again, find what you're interested in. Uh, you don't have to know everything. There are a lot of people that are specialized in so many things. So just uh, find what you really want to specialize on. I think. Uh, let me add something quick. Sorry, 
I know there are many questions. Um, and another thing, uh, which was very helpful for me when I was in high school is a uh, conversation with alumni. Right, mm -hmm. so I talk about like, you know, yeah, you can tr try many different things, but of course, time is limited. You cannot try everything, right? So it's it's really great to talk with alumni because they have tried different things, and from them you can get some feedback, right? So networking, learning many different perspectives, uh, that could be an um, efficient way to find uh, the your own goal. I would say that's a great advice. And actually, if you are interested, like here at Max Planck, all the scientists are very open and you can see enthusiastic about their work. Or in general, even if it's not neuroscientists, what I found out is that usually if you approach people with a genuine interest, hey, I would like to go in your career, um, can you tell me more? Usually people like to help and to help you understand what their jobs entail. So definitely a great advice. Thank you. What's your question? Hi, my name is Damien from Santa Lucius, and I was wondering, do you guys ever have to implement different fields of science in your work or like consult with other scientists that study different from you to help you understand anything? Who can take this one? Yeah, Nina? Take it. Um, yes, definitely. So depending on your expertise and what your lab is doing, um, collaboration is, is the key so to success. So in, in some cases where you don't have a technique in your lab or you you know you need um, to use different tools to analyze your data you may approach other labs that or other scientists you have met probably in conferences or you know and and they may help and you may collaborate on the same project and then uh, go faster you may also send one of your students or go directly there to learn the technique and then bring it back to the lab or invite someone to come to your lab to actually perform the experiment. So it is really often that, yeah, uh, more and more actually now, it is well appreciated by journals that, you know, you use different techniques um, to, to make your point, yeah. Thank you. What's your question? Hi, my name is Matthew Fitzpatrick from the Benjamin School. So how many tries, like on average, or how many experience, experiments do you have to take before you like make a discovery, before you find a discovery? <laughs> oh. That's a hard one. Who can take? <laughs> um, that's the more a, experienced one. <laughs> What's that's the a difficult question. Uh, so there is a theory behind that. I mean, statistics. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I don't want to go into too much of detail. But it depends on how much of noise you have in the measurement and how big the effect size is. Um, and so there is no general answer to that but we can make an estimation how much we need to do, and that is different from case to case. So, but usually we have some rough idea how many times we need to do, and we start from there. And yeah, that's how it goes. But sometimes, yeah, 100 times or something. <laughs> and so it's not always necessarily fun. We need to repeat, 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 but you know, uh, as you know, many of us emphasize, make sure that we can reproduce the finding is really essential, right? Because without that, then that's not actual finding. Can I add something to this? Uh, so the reason why we eventually work with animal mo animals uh, is because different from uh, what is done in human studies, uh, they're looking at correlation if one thing is correlated with another thing, right? We are trying to form a causation uh, mechanism in animal experiments because we have full access to their brain, right? Uh, so when you want to say something causes something, then you have to make sure that uh, you eliminate all the everything else behind, right? So you have to make sure that you have very proper controls. Uh, and that is the, the actually the most time consuming part when you're trying to make a discovery. That's what uh, Hideko was trying to say. Uh, yeah, so whatever is necessary to prove that this is the cause, uh, you're going to do that many experiments, but it's definitely not easy. That's why uh, obtaining a PhD or postdoc is it's always very time consuming. You're looking at like five to seven years of education. So, and majority of the time really goes for controls. Yeah, and you need a bit of time to, you know, learn the technique also. Some experiments are tricky, and uh, you're doing it for the first time, it's not really likely you're going to succeed the first time also. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Lucy, and I'm from Jupiter 
High School. Um, my question was, um, what is the environment for the scientific community? Is it more cooperative, like you mentioned before, or is it more cutthroat and competitive to get funding and grants for your research? That is a great question. That is a great question. Who wants to go first? Okay, should I go? Okay, so You're the most experienced. Okay. So the uh, <laughs> yes, uh, as an institute, uh, we are very really cooperative, meaning that there are a lot of collaboration between labs. Of course, within the lab, but even between the labs, we work together. And we have a lot of seminars so that we can share our discoveries before even we publish it. So we are trying to really enhance the collaboration because, you know, science is becoming harder and harder because we many things are interdisciplinary. So just single, it's almost impossible for a single person to make uh, uh, really important findings at this point. The team of people need to work. So in that regard, yes, uh, we are trying to push for open science. And also, as an entire field of the science, like uh, it's becoming more important to share the data and share the code or share materials so that we can do um, your open science and to make sure we can reproduce the findings. Uh, when it comes to funding, yes, <laughs> that's a tricky <laughs> business because the amount of money, research budget is limited, right? Mostly we get from the NIH, from the government, and of course they only have limited budget for science. So of course, at that stage, it becomes competitive, but it's my job to get money here so that people can do uh, open and enjoy science. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. What's your question? Hi, my name is Brianna Cicada, and I'm from Dreyfus. And I was just wondering if you guys like name the animals that you're working with. <laughs> so um, I'm working on mouse. Yeah, uh, that's what you mean for. Like, like yeah. if you give them names. Oh, name. Oh, sorry, I, I misunderstood. I think it's um, more for the Drosophila people. Yeah, <laughs> <Is that> uh, <laughs> we have ID for all of them. And actually, so what we do is um, we basically look train the animal for some tasks because we are looking at cognitive aspect or motor aspect uh, control of the brain. So we spend a lot of time together with <laughs> individual animals, <laughs> uh, like checking their health status every day in the morning. <laughs> so they have um, ID because in, in just because of the system, we need to have like you know, some numbers and other things, but everyone basically remember that because <laughs> we spend so much of time with individual animals. So yes. We don't give them like some specific human-like name, but yeah. Yes, yeah, same for us. I mean, um, <laughs> we have more than thousand flies, you know, in one tube only. And <laughs> if you think about <laughs> naming each one by one, would be really tricky. However, we also have, you know, ID numbers and um, uh, the number of the transgenic line. We use transgenic flies, so we, we, we have specific names. And, but we name neurons, though, you know. We have to recognize neurons, so people give names to neurons. Um, yeah, more for practical reasons. Thank you. Go Hello, ahead. I'm Michelle Plant from St. Lucia's High School. My question is, as a neuroscientist, do you think your job entails a lot of traveling? And if so, how's like, where's the farthest you've been to research? You should talk a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> How much traveling is involved in science? I I think it is a bit up to you. <laughs> how much do you want to travel? How much do you want to uh, go to different conferences or and network with uh, other scientists? Um, if you don't want to travel, you don't have to. <laughs> you can just conduct your experiments, right, and uh, present in local conferences and so on. Uh, but if you want to widen your uh, network, then uh, it's it's helpful to travel. So it's it's uh, it's up to the person. Usually, PIs, uh, especially after um, uh, they're more like established, they travel a lot. Um, they uh, collaborate with different labs in different countries and so on. So that, that helps the students too in return, actually. But yeah, the, the bottom line is, yeah, it's, it's really up to you how much you travel in neuroscience. Thank you. So yeah. You go. Maybe I did something, something about geographic mobility. So we're talking about traveling you know, for conferences where you're like, you have one location you're working and then you're traveling back and forth. But um, the, the work per se also requires you to, when you change, let's say from master to PhD or PhD postdoc, you also need 
at some point maybe you're not obliged to but you may need also to travel and to change basically maybe change countries and stuff like that so you need it's 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 well recommended to have some you know geographic mobility and and travel um it comes with some challenges sometimes maybe we can talk about that later but yeah that's that's recommended for each one of you where would you say you stand on the nature versus nurture debate Mm -hmm. um, in like the nature versus on like psychology, how mm -hmm. uh, how uh, either your environment determines your behavior or is right. it like genetic behavior? Um, I well, my opinion is both. I mean, there are tons of evidence for both, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there are a lot of twin study, for example, yeah. in the field of psychology, and obviously both of them are involved. Is that the question? I is that the answer? So yeah. I guess yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the answer is both. <laughs> Same. Okay, so we have a unanimous opinion on the topic. <laughs> Go ahead. This is for Ms. Uz. So it says in a little blurb that you innovate methods to precisely manipulate proteins. What are some of those methods that you have innovated? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> so um, we're trying to combine different methods, right? We're, com we're trying to combine genetics and um, and optogenetics. If it's going to, did you guys have any tour? Any, any they didn't mention see of anything of optogenetics no. today. Uh, no. So. I'm trying to approach this in, with different um, techniques. Um, sometimes I'm trying to combine genetics with chemistry. Uh, so I make genetic manipulations, uh, manipulations so that this protein is going to be um, affected by a certain chemical, but not in the other genetic uh, groups. So if it is a wild type, for example, that does not carry this mutation, this chemical is not going to affect this animal, whereas the, the mutant animal is going to get uh, impacted by this chemical and this protein is going to get, like it, its activity is going to be manipulated. Uh, that's one strategy. Another strategy that I take is called optogenetics that's commonly used in neuroscience, which is um, traditionally used to control the neuronal activity with the light, actually. We put optogenetic probes, like the fiber, optic glass fibers, within the brain and uh, control the activity of neurons. We either turn them on or off uh, with literally blue light or yellow light, whichever light you prefer. Uh, we do this uh, by infusing viruses and so on, hijacking viruses and do this like genetic uh, manipulations. But uh, so I also utilize this technique called optogenetics uh, to do this. Um, again, I make genetic uh, manipulations on the um, on the mouse um, and make them e make these proteins uh, be controlled uh, by the light, pretty much. So. Thank you. Ah, they did? Okay, Good perfect. Show. Perfect, yeah. So. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Bronson from the Benjamin School, and my question is, what's each of your favorite discoveries you've made and why? <laughs> what's your favorite discovery? Okay, this is a tough one. Nino, do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it's difficult to choose, actually. So. Um, I mean, I'm relatively early in the <laughs> in the career, right? So I didn't make so many discoveries, but I can mention my PhD, which was, you know, like long longest term one. Um, okay, I'll try to be simple here. We basically discovered that a big neuron in the brain of the lava had a role that we did not expect at all. It was actually rewarding when you activate this neuron artificially, it was rewarding to the lava, and this was not predicted at all. It's like, you know, we have dopaminergic neurons in our, you know, um, that, that convey reward, this neuron was, completely different, but we found that it's actually doing very, something very similar. And it was super unexpected, and that's why I really liked it. But recently in, 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 in my current lab, um, so the lab of Salil, um, we also made some very interesting discovery on stopping behavior, and we have like, you know, released a, 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 a study really recently, so it is really exciting as well. What's your favorite discovery? <laughs> Yeah, so I work on a group of enzymes known as protein kinases that were discovered like 50 years ago or so. Uh, it has different types. Um, 
and they're very structurally similar to each other. So scientists uh, have been trying to manipulate their activity for the last 50 years because they have been involved in many different diseases. Uh, and no one was able to actually like really specifically manipulate their function. And I don't want to say it, it's a complete discovery yet, <laughs> but I'm still try trying to do the controls, but it seems to me uh, so far that, yeah, we may have uh, accomplished this goal and uh, we, I made uh, some, some inhibitors for these specific proteins. So that's my biggest discovery, I would say. Okay, um, in my case, so uh, before I came here, I was working on something called short-term memory. Like if I tell a random number now, like seven digits, you can remember it, right, for a few seconds, but after a minute, you know, most likely you will forget. So somehow the brain can remember information for multiple seconds, and that's essential, right? E even when we talk, right, you need to remember what you said and other people said, right, before you take another action. And, uh, and it's really puzzling because actually individual neuron in the brain can only maintain information for 10 milliseconds or so. Like one, you know, just 10 milliseconds, okay? It's not even a second. So uh, we basically discovered the algorithm how the brain maintains information longer than what individual neuron can do. And basically, the kind of answer is all the neurons are talking to each other, right? And so the one neuron talks to the other, other neuron talks back, and that kind of loop maintains. So that's kind of. Uh, finding I like. And the other thing is, well, we recently uh, we discovered uh, there is one type of neurons in the neocortex, right, the biggest part of our brain. Uh, there is a specific neuron which seems to be more important for us to learn new skill. So I think it's important. And actually, so, you know, it, it's always hard to tell what is discovery because we think, like, in my case, I think it's important finding. But it may take a while for other people to start saying, okay, that's actually a discovery or not. So, <laughs> again, it's less dramatic. I, we need to establish finding and you know, accumulate everything. And yeah, so Thank that's you. the answer. Go ahead. Uh, what, what do you guys think of AI, like, in all? <laughs> million dollar question. Who wants to go with this one? Who, what do you think about AI? I mean, so far, I think it's a very useful tool. <laughs> so we're using um, like ChatGPT uh, in our everyday life, pretty much. I, I do, at least. I don't know if they, <laughs> they do, but um, whenever I have a question, like I just ask ChatGPT, it's like, hey, what do you think? Like, <laughs> what, what do you know about this? And it gives me a lot of uh, answer. Uh, but also, it is very important to use it wisely, uh, right? So we always uh, think about uh, what is the right question to ask. Uh, to ChatGPT and uh, take the answers that it gives you um, very critically because it a lot of the times gives you very wrong answers. Um, so it's a useful tool that we really need to wisely use and uh, be like um, just be critical about the answers, right? So that's so far what we think about AI, but in the future, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I completely agree with uh, what uh, Goksu just said. Um, I think it should be used wisely um, for the good reasons. It can be really useful. So in our field, you know, like uh, if you think about the reconstruction of a fly brain or any brain, that may help humans a lot. Um, but again, yeah, using uh, for the proper things. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's a great tool. Um, and like. You know, when I was in high school, people started using internet actively, and that's like around when we had similar conversation, right? But <laughs> at the end, it's a tool, right? So uh, we just need to use it widely. Like ChatGPT, everything that learned is based on information on the internet, so it doesn't have anything beyond that, for example. So we need to understand that it's a useful tool to source in others, but you need to have ability to tell what is wrong and what is correct by yourself. Um, and also the other thing, I actually, I, I went to a conference and there was an engineer in the micro, Microsoft talking about the new version of ChatGPT, which seems to be even more amazing than the current version. And, but the engineer asked ChatGPT, how do you work? <laughs> how do you get to this answer? And the answer was, it doesn't know. So <laughs> it's another big black box, actually. It seems like, you know, we have this amazing system and like we, 
people may think, okay, now we can understand the intelligence, but actually ChatGPT itself doesn't know how it works by itself. So <laughs> we still have a big black box. Uh, and on that topic, like the how you're saying that with the fly brain, how you know the complete structure of it, would you be able to like imitate, uh, imitate like the brain functions with AI, like ma make a fly AI? So, well, n not yet, but the thing is, so I for example, there are people working, so Salil went recently to a conference where um, uh, engineers are trying to, you know, simulate a fly. So it's not complete yet, of course, you know, so they're trying really to have uh, a virtual fly um, with segments. There is no muscles or stuff like that that are modeled there. But we are going into this direction, yes. Um, we are far from it. You know, we barely understand how the brain works still. We're making a lot of progresses, but it's only the beginning uh, to understand the circuit. So, but I, I, yeah, why not at some point? You know, it might work. Go ahead. Um, what's the most funding that you've ever received, like for an experiment? What's the most of funding, so the amount of money, the biggest grant that you ever receive? Right? That is the question? Yes. I, I don't know. Like, uh, <laughs> you don't remember? I think, uh, wait. Maybe you can say... Uh, Some, something two to three million, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, actually, but if, if you think about it, I have 10 people working in my lab. I need to pay their salary, my salary, and everything. Actually, it's like huge amount of money. It's like small company, actually, individual lab. So, <laughs> and we are not for profit, right? So only way for us to get money is not selling the product, but write paper, make fun finding, then we get funding, right? So sounds like a lot, but actually, if you think of a small company, so you have to have some budgeting skills to, to run a lab, basically. But yeah, science is way more expensive uh, than uh, the average person, I think. I think we all agree on, I was very shocked when I start to order things at re realizing how much the reagents and the instrument cost. So yeah, there are a lot of money involved. Yeah, especially for animals, we need to make sure they're you know, take care of their welfare and need to use all the medical quality stuff, right? So, yeah, things are expensive too. Uh, you want you. to go, oh, you have another one? Oh, you're okay. Oh, no. <laughs> awesome. Go ahead. Um, I'm Marina Demarzio from Jythus, and my question is, how do you guys do stuff to flies without killing them? Hmm? Doing things to flies without killing them. Yeah, because they're small. Yeah, you have to be really gentle with them. Yeah, <laughs> really, really <laughs> yeah, you may end up killing them very easily. Um, we actually use brush. So basically, if you want to catch flies, uh, you can make fall them asleep. You know, you use CO2 or ice. They fall asleep, and then you can manipulate them with brush, li little tiny brush, and then you put them in, you know, tubes or stuff like that without hurting them. Okay. <laughs> so the answer is sleep. Uh, and kindness. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Hi, um, my name is Kate. I go to Jupiter High. And my question is, based off of what you're um, mainly researching or experimenting with right now, what's the main thing you're trying to understand or like your biggest question? OK. So currently, what are the biggest questions we want to understand? Is the, OK. What is your big question you are going after now? Yeah, so I mean, we have di so. As postdoc, we you know are on different projects. Um, my current main project, so I'm working on different things, but the current main project I am on is more technical. So what we, what I want to do is develop a um, platform that has been already developed in mice, in order to kind of read the brain of the fly, you know, so read the activity of neurons in, in behaving flies. So imagine a fly which is on a treadmill, you know, you put your microscope, you open the head, and then you look at the brain activity. And um, you do that in a fancy, very expensive microscope where you also have, um, you know, different lasers to also activate artificial neurons. So you can read the activity of neurons, but you can also kind of write the activity of neurons. Um, that way, we, we hope we can understand how, you know, those neurons interact to give rise to a certain behavior. So in our case, you know, maneuvers, you know, turning or stuff like that. So, yeah, that's my current challenge right now. What's so your current challenge? 
The current challenge is uh, to, of course, convince the field that these um, new tools that I'm uh, innovating are working <laughs> <laughs> and they're specific. They do what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and then following that, I would like to use those tools to understand their, these molecules' roles in learning and memory uh, in different brain regions at different time points. Uh, and following that is uh, to use these tools in, um, in disease models, like for, to treat Alzheimer's disease, for example, and uh, to see if whether these molecules are playing a role in uh, these types of diseases, and if I can help um, alleviate in some of the symptoms or the disease uh, to begin with. Uh, so that's number one. It's not just for the brain disorders, actually. These proteins that I'm trying to manipulate are involved in many other diseases, such as ca cancer. Um, so like one of the proteins that I made an inhibitor for is uh, highly involved in uh, melanoma, the skin cancer. So I envision in the future with a collaboration, we can use these tools to perhaps uh, stop the progress of the, can the progression of the cancer uh, in, in skin and maybe in one day it could even be used for uh, treating human patients. So that's, I'm dream big, I'm a P PhD student, that's <laughs> my role. <laughs> Yeah, so my single sentence answer is uh, we want to understand the learning. So, and there are different kind of learning, right? Like, you know, you may remember what we talk about today, like tomorrow. This is, this kind of memory and learning is called episodic memory, because you remember the episode. And this is uh, mediated by brain region called hippocampus. Maybe you have learned that in textbook. But actually, there are many different kinds of learning, right? Like, you know, and many of them are even not conscious. Like, you learn how to ride a bike, how to write, how to speak. And brain has really amazing ability to learn uh, without, and, it, and it's different from episodic memory. And that mechanism is still not well understood, although it's so important. So understanding that is one of the major goals, and that will help us also to treat many diseases which affect the learning memory. So I would say that's a big goal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Um, my name is Santiago from Santa Lucia's High School, and I wanted to know, is there a reason as to why us humans are so curious as to ourselves and our surroundings? Mm. This is more a philosophical question <laughs> than a neuroscience, but does any of you have anything about that? That's a very great question. And okay, short answer is no, we don't know yet. <laughs> but obviously, as you know, um, animal evolves, uh, we have more ability to explore, right? So there are many different like uh, um, ways to learn things. Like one is, uh, let's say, uh, supervised learning, right? Like if we do it, there is an answer, so we can learn. But you know, what we often do in our life is something called reinforcement learning. We explore and interact with the environment and then based on the outcome, we learn what to do, right? And this ability is important because, okay, first of all, usually there's no answer, right? Uh, when you do behavior, so you just need to try and get the answer. And in order to try things, of course, you need to have some kind of strong motivation to try it, right? So I think there is a strong pleasure during evolution that we, our brains are above to try many things so that we can find the proper solution for whatever question. That's my guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What's your question? I'm Melissa from Santa Lucia. So I was wondering, seeing that the, these experiments are like extensive, taking multiple years, is it difficult to like maintain a balance between work and like a social life and having other hobbies? Okay. Uh, so how is the work-life balance uh, for a scientist? Uh, do you want to go first, Nina? Yeah, it's a common challenge, a well-known challenge <laughs> in <laughs> science, but. Yeah, as I mentioned early, um, this job, we, we never bored, right? There are a lot of things to do. And I mean, this makes it very exciting. But on the other hand, it can comes with, you know, you can get slightly overwhelmed if you don't know to organize mm -hmm. yourself properly or if you don't have the correct strategy to be, you know, efficient. Um, yeah, so the solution is, yeah, to find a strategy to be well organized. Um, try to come at regular hours, uh, but sometimes there are cases where you need to push things a little bit, uh, and, and sometimes we don't even realize we're working. I have to say that, you know, you're doing an experiment you're very excited about, um, you want to pursue it, you want to finish things, and then, you know, you do just come to the lab. Um, yeah, 
I think it's important still to keep things outside the lab, you know, um, have a social life, have hobbies, sport or music or whatever you like, um, because this helps the science too, you know, and, and, and you know, doing th things outside the lab with your colleagues as well and other friends outside, non-scientist people as well. All of these contributes to, I think, the success of your science. Thank you. You have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, just one thing from PI's person. It really depends on person to person. So whatever, yeah, as Nino said, it sounds like you know people focus on finding and doing experiments. And as a manager side, what I say is, yeah, that's great, but don't forget, you know, are okay, and make sure to take a break if necessary. And you know, <coughs> at the end, you, people just need to find the solution for themselves because I don't think there is a single solution. And like in my case, you know, I, I always go back home and play with kids, and that's a very important part of my life. So yes, just Thank need you. to find a solution. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, one second. Don't worry. I have a bonus question that I always like uh, to ask, because we, of course, talk about the positive, but um, what's, in your opinion, the toughest part of the job of being a scientist while you think about your question? I think we only talk a negative side, right? Like how hard it is to make discovery and, you know, reproduce. I mean, it's fun to make finding, but at the same time, for the finding to be the area service of the finding, there are a lot of control and sometimes tedious things we need to go over and over, but that's yeah. for the big goal. We mentioned funding too, right? Like how hard yeah. it is to get a grant sometimes. Yes. And I also briefly mentioned, you know, geographic mobility, which can be awesome sometimes, you know, to, I mean, it's really recommended to d discover new labs and, and work in new lab culture. But this comes with some challenges, sometimes mm -hmm. administrative challenges and for some people from some country, you know, visa, passport, whatever things, or, you know, being far from your family and friends. I mean, sometimes you get to go back only every year, once a year or, so you should be aware of that. Um, but in general, it's nice because if your lab is welcoming, then you, you really like enjoy it. And if you manage to go back to your country, visit your family, that's, that's all. And they come also visit you, so it's nice. Uh, is it sometimes hard like not to get distracted by stuff when you're traveling, like other like discoveries and stuff, rather than just focusing on what you went there for? Um, no, you get distracted sometimes, but it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? So you uh, go to a conference, you hear all these talks from all these amazing scientists, and your brain is like, oh my god, there's so much more that I can do. What if I apply this to my project? What if I do this? What if I do that? So your project becomes, like, evolves within itself just because of the things, amount of things that you learn and the, the, the distraction, honestly, that you have uh, within those um, seminars or conferences, right? So, but it, it, it eventually helps uh, you and your project mm, most of the time. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just like go into this loophole and trying to do this thing and it, it just never works. But at the end of the day, I think um, it evolves your project <coughs> and you as a scientist. Go ahead. Um, where do you get the animals that you like use for your experiment? Um, basically, there is a supply the companies is um, provide us. Thank you. Yeah, we have a big library of you know in Bermuda, big, big library of flies. Actually, big huge collections of transgenic flies. You can order them and receive them. Yeah, but we usually get. Um, you can also make uh, genome editing in these animals, right? So you get them from these big companies, but also you could use techniques like CRISPR-Cas9 to do the genome editing and make the transgenic lines yourself in-house, so in, in the institute. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Teles from Santa Lucia. Uh, I have a question. I think you're doing a great job. It's fantastic what we're hearing. Um, after you discover something, or you find something, I assume someone is going to use it. So how does that work? What is the next step? So it means you discover, I, I'm a, it really took my attention about human behavior, how that work. 
So I assume we are going to use that results in, uh, in clinical. So who's going to use that or how you work with to apply that in real life? Yeah, so uh, I can answer that maybe. Um, so we really want people to use the things that we discovered, right? That, that, that's the, that's the goal, mm -hmm. that's the end goal. Uh, we make things, we publish them with proper controls. We expect people to replicate these and uh, get similar results as, as, uh, as we do, right? Uh, that also confirms and gives you confidence that what you did actually worked. Um, and this goes through stages. So we do these experiments only in fruit flies or mice uh, with an MPFI. Uh, but after we publish, if the finding is important enough or is significant enough, uh, then it goes through higher order animals, right? So then they do monkey the studies on monkeys, which is like primates. Uh, this is uh, a lot closer to humans. Uh, so those are being tested on uh, the primates, and if it is still looking very promising, very significant, and um, can make a change in uh, for human health, uh, then they start doing the preclinical studies. But uh, what we do will not is, does not directly is not directly applied to humans. Of course, within a year or so, it goes through a. Uh, tremendous amount of work uh, and many, 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 many years before it is being used on humans. So you work with uh, clinical scientists when you, res for example, now you research. You're working with a clinical scientist you too, or is after you finish your your project or your research? Yeah, unfortunately, this is a very slow process, right? So what we do is not to like we don't collaborate with clinical scientists. We we find we we do our findings, we publish them in journals. And uh, again, uh, like our job is actually to throw information in a giant pool, uh, right? So each scientist contributes to this pool uh, of information and uh, publishes a paper, whether it, the, your results are negative or positive, right? So we all publish and each scientist like looks at this literature, this pool of information, uh, does the revision uh, of this information and then decides uh, how can how they can move this forward. We don't directly collaborate with the clinical scientists, but after I publish, perhaps another scientist or a collabor collaborator that does monkey studies, for example, could potentially take these tools and apply it on primates. And if it still looks promising, uh, it could be used many, many, many years later on humans. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, just to add, I mean, what we do is something called basic science. Um, and our science is basically curiosity driven. And the reason why we do this, and there's a big group of people, scientists doing this, I mean, in the US and of course across the world. And the main reason is because we really cannot predict where the discovery will lead us. Like if you see the Nobel Prize this year, right? Or even like all the Nobel Prize, actually, most of the Nobel Prize in the past, they are not translational research. They are basic research, looking at some bacteria, some, some species, nobody knew what, why it's important <laughs> or something. But that often help us make a breakthrough. So unfortunately, because we don't know everything, we just need to accumulate the knowledge so that you know, we can uh, translate it for the medical purposes. So of course, the end goal is to translate it for something can help people. But at the same time, in order to achieve that goal, we need to accumulate the basic knowledge. So that's what we do. I'm sorry, last question. Mm -hmm. Where um, you say you look for, for money, right? Because you need it for your research. Usually, who is the ones to participate more with you? Ah, sorry. Uh, about the money you need uh -huh. for your research, uh -huh. usually is the the companies or the groups to participate more with you. Oh, it's a to tax support your research. It's from the government. Oh, okay. Most of them. I mean, there are private foundations as well, but the big proportions are coming from the taxpayer. And yeah. Thank, Thank you, to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would it be possible, like, with enzymes, like something, an enzyme that's been denatured, to co like change the code of a the the enzyme to if it is denatured, make it so it like the first substrate it interacts with or something, uh, change its purpose to change like its function to doing that one through like induced fit or something along those lines. 
Well, you're the enzyme person. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say this is for you. Well, well the molecules, enzymes, uh, they change all the time. They change their structure, their conformation, how they interact with other molecules and so on. They, they do change this all the time. And yes, they're like the simple answer is yes, when they change the whole molecular cascade changes and what the consequence of uh, their activity also changes too. Uh, but yeah, this this happens within our cells every millisecond, pretty much. That enzymes change their uh, function. Enzymes change their uh, conformation, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this was the last question because we are almost uh, out of time. So I think uh, we should uh, give a big round of applause to our panelists. <laughs>